one of my favorite disciples. Of course, I say that about a lot of them, don't I? But depending on which one we're talking about on any given day, each of the disciples that Jesus chose usually has some quality or another that we can look at because Jesus chose them for those reasons. We look at Peter. We often talk about Peter as being that impetuous disciple, the one who speaks before he thinks. Certain qualities about that that I admire. Some of you have already noted that about me. We know John, the egghead, the philosopher. And some of you say, too many words. You've noted that about me as well. A certain thing about that I admire. And we can go down the list, and all of us, I think, can look at each of the 12 that Jesus gathered around him, and there are certain qualities that each of us can admire, and maybe over time, we ourselves have appropriated. But I always look forward to this day in our observance of the liturgical year, because each year we have this thing we call Thomas, Sunday, when we hear this particular gospel lesson, as we celebrate this Easter day yet again, we studied on our Bible study on Thursday, we talked about the liturgical context of this day, where this is the octave day of Easter. We've been celebrating Easter for eight days. So this is like Easter Sunday all over again. And the gospel lesson that we just heard even says it that way. That on that being the first day of the week, that tells us it was Easter Sunday, they were locked away in that upper room for fear. And Jesus appears to them. And so this gospel today begins by telling us that this is Easter Sunday all over again. And we've been hearing that if you were looking at the lessons appointed for the Eucharist for each of the days during this past Easter week. We even call it Easter Monday, Easter Tuesday, Easter Wednesday, and so on. That each of them was an Easter story told again and again and again and again. No exception today. But then we segue into a, another point of time, the week after when Thomas appears. Thomas is with them. And for this whole week, Thomas has been now. I don't believe. We've often said Thomas might be from Missouri. You know, the show me state. We've said these things over and over again. They're always cute little things to say. I've talked about Thomas being maybe the first of the modern kind of scientist, scientific method. First doubt then prove, test, trust, but verify, all of these kinds of phrases we've used before in analyzing this idea of Thomas. But one of the reasons I like him so is because he's so honest. He's honest. How many of us, oh, yes, yeah, say, we, oh, we believe in God. We believe all this stuff. Deep down in our hearts, we have our doubts. We're not really sure. We don't have that utter and pure certainty that comes with having seen for ourselves. But you see, that's what faith is all about now, isn't it? It's about not being sure. That's why I think it's good for us to hear this story over and over and over again because it reminds us that none of us is really, in our heart of heart, that certain. Really. We may get to that point where we feel we are certain. But it's 
always that last lingering sliver of faith. That's the way we are. That's the way we're constructed. And the reason God made us that way is so that we always ask the next question. Because it's only when we ask that next question that we are capable of growing. Once we think we've got it all, that's it. We're done. We don't need to grow. We don't need to move. It's only when we think we need just a little bit more that we can begin to move on, to move through, to begin to understand a little bit more, to grow a little bit deeper. But the roots go down further, and we become. That's what this day is about. It's not about having no conviction of faith at all. See, because to me, Thomas's seeming absolute doubt is actually the promise of Thomas's absolute strength. Because once he's convinced, notice how quickly he goes at what his affirmation of faith is. It's not. Oh, ain't it nice, Jesus, you're here. He falls down and he says, My Lord and my God. You can't get stronger faith than that. When's the last time you did that? After you had a bit of doubt. When's the last time you professed your deep and abiding faith in God in that way. My Lord, my God. What we see. Brothers and sisters, not about all of this. It's about coming to that deep and abiding conviction in our heart that God would do anything for you. That God walks with you at every moment of your life. From the moment you draw your first breath until the moment we breathe no longer. That God is loving you with the tick of every second, with the beat of your heart at all times. God is surrounding you with his grace, with his love, with his love, even when you don't. All we need to do is speak. And that's what faith is about. Opening our eyes to see God at work about us. We will say those words in a few moments. But that must be our earnest prayer. That we would be able to see God at work in every moment of our lives, sustaining us, healing us, raising us up, that God is at work in our family, among our friends, even when things are not going well, when things are awry, when things seemingly are falling apart. God is with us. God never abandoned. That's the key. Oh, we remember Jesus alone. 
we hear Jesus' cry of abandonment. But Jesus holds true. He's deeply convinced of his father's love and was strengthened for the journey. We are about to embark on a similar journey. We, as a community of faith, as a family, are about to step out in faith. We are about to journey on into a new chapter in our lives. I am leaving you. Not forever. It may seem like that for me. For you, oh my God, he's back already? But you will walk step by step into a new vision, into a new way of doing things. It's time. The Lord has been making us fit for mission. The Lord has been strengthening us, strengthening us that we might step out into this community, into our world, to make a difference to proclaim the good news, to raise up those whose hearts have been broken, to call those who've been pushed to the margins of our society, to make them part of the family of God. The Lord is calling you by name to be part of that great work. Your part may be small, it may be large, no one knows. But he is calling you. You need to answer that call. I will be far away. I will be listening for my call and what that means for me on my return. I pray that you will hear it as well. And in looking for the mark, you will also begin to see what Jesus has in store.